I ask you a simple question. See if you can answer it. Where does God live? Now, you, I'll tell you where He doesn't live, Staten Island. <laughs> you know that. Well, the Bible says He inhabits eternity. That's His residence, and it's a permanent residence, an immutable residence because He Himself is from everlasting to everlasting. And that's the theme that we're going to consider briefly now after we pray. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, eternity and its realm seems more and more foreign to our understanding and to our experience. It's too high, it's too holy, it's too remote for us to grasp. And yet, through Your goodness and through the sweetness of Your plan of redemption, You have visited us from that realm and prepared for us a place in that realm. And so we ask that You would condescend now to help us understand something of the importance and significance of eternity, Your place of residence. For we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. They say that Augustine was the greatest theologian of the first millennium of Christian history and perhaps of all time, and I have no argument at all with that assessment. And we know that of his many works, perhaps the one for which he is most famous is that classic work entitled The City of God, in which in it he writes in vivid language the stark contrast between the city of God and the city of man. Well, not to be outdone, in the middle of the 20th century, a Harvard professor of sociology and theology, Harvey Cox, wrote a book that was a runaway bestseller entitled, Not the City of God, but the Secular City. And what he was trying to do was to give us an understanding of the culture in which we live at this time in human history. And he spoke about a philosophy called secularism. And in doing so, he began first by defining the word secular and looking at its Latin root, the word saculum from which we get the word secular, he pointed out that the secular describes this world not in terms of space, but in terms of time. The Latin language had two distinct words, in fact more than that, but two major words for the word earth or world. One describes the world in terms of space, the other one in terms of time. The Latin word for world in terms of space is the word mundus, from which we have the word mundane, and we've already heard today a reference to Athanasius and a mention of what is written on his tombstone, Athanasius contra mundum, Athanasius against the world. Their mundus describes the world in terms of this place here. On the other hand, the word saculum is another word for world, but the reference of that word 
is not to this world in terms of this place or this space, but rather in terms of this time or the realm of the temporal. And so the term saculum was religiously neutral in its original orientation and functioned just fine in the medieval church where priests were distinguished between those priests priests that were ordained for work in the, uh, <clears throat> the realm of the ecclesium, the church, and those who were secular priests, those whose job took them outside the doors of the church or of the monastery, and they would work among the poor and do other such services, simply meaning that they were laboring right now to the needs of people right here. Perfectly good word. But when you take a nice, good, innocent word and put that ominous suffix on it, those three little letters, I-S-M, everything changes. It's one thing to be human. It's another thing to embrace humanism. It's one thing to be feminine. It's another thing to embrace feminism. It's one thing to exist. It's quite another to embrace existentialism. Well, in the same manner, it's perfectly fine to be secular, but as soon as we speak about secularism, we're now talking about a worldview, a philosophy, a system of thinking that Harvey Cox said defined what you would call the zeitgeist of 20th century and certainly into the 21st century of America and the Western world. A zeitgeist, which word comes not from the Latin but from the German, means the spirit of the time or the spirit of the age. And Harvey Cox is saying we were living in the post-Christian era where life is no longer considered in light of the eternal, but rather in terms of the secular. And the simple credo of secularism is this, that all human life takes place in the here and the now in the realm of the temporal. And beyond the here and the now, beyond the temporal, there is simply nothing else. It's not simply a, an epistemological skepticism that says, like following Immanuel Kant, that by rational inquiry we can't ascend to the realm of metaphysics. We can't ascend through the use of theoretical thought into the level of the eternal. No, secularism says the reason why we can't ascend into the realm of the eternal is because there is no realm of the eternal. After the Kantian critique of the classical and traditional Christian synthesis, Many philosophers then opted for various forms of skepticism and cynicism, such as uh, atheistic existentialism with its category of nihilism, saying that in the final analysis, not what there is here is das nicht. There is the nothingness, the nihil. There's nobody home up there. And so all we have is this world and you only go around once. And so you may grab the gusto and embrace a creed that says, whoever owns the most toys when he dies wins, but he still dies. And when he dies, the here and the now is over. Rudolf Bultmann in the 20th century tried to 
create a synthesis between existential philosophy and Christianity and said that we need a theology of timelessness, again, a theology of the hicketnunc, the here and the now, and forget about any aspirations of eternity. And he captured the imagination of New Testament scholars all over the world, and they have made their influence felt with a vengeance in many of the churches of this day. The spirit of our times is the spirit of secularism. When you're dead, you're dead, and that's it. There's this time and this time only. Now, Harvey Cox went on to say that the shape of America in light of this secularism has been developed by the only homegrown philosophical system that was ever generated in the continental United States. And it was the philosophical system known as pragmatism. Many years ago at Harvard University, they had a club on the campus of Harvard University, and it was called the Metaphysical Club. And as history would find somewhat ironic, during one particular period of Harvard's uh, undergraduate time, there were four men who were members of this metaphysical club. And of course, the metaphysical club was a club devoted to the pursuit of the understanding of that realm which exists above and beyond the physical realm, the realm of eternity. And these four members of the club, one and all, changed their minds and completely rejected metaphysics entirely. Charles Piercy, Percy I should say, John Dewey, William James, Oliver Wendell Holmes. Four guys, you won't find any four men who have had more influence on the shaping of American culture than those four men, all of whom rejected metaphysics and embraced a kind of philosophy called pragmatism. Since we can't know ultimate truth, and in fact there is no such thing as ultimate truth, we have to be practical and define truth in terms of that which works. For Dewey, it's away with the model of classical education because the model of classical education was based on the principle of theology as being the queen of the sciences and philosophy her handmaiden. And now, since we know nothing more significant about theology or philosophy in a metaphysical sense, education should be changed for an agenda that is practical, and nothing is less practical in the training of our children than the knowledge of God. Dewey's influence on the American system of education is immeasurable, as James was to psychology, as Percy was to philosophy, and it was the preface to Oliver Wendell Holmes classic work on British common law in which he set forth the idea that we can no longer base law on some kind of super ethical structure of natural law or some kind of supernatural law. Law must be established on the basis of the common community standards of a given period and a given place and a given time so that the laws of one community can differ from the laws of another community. And as long as the majority of the people in that community embrace it, that's fine. The current Vice President of the United States of America, when Clarence Thomas was before the Permanent Judicial Committee of the United States Senate to be 
confirmed to his appointment to the Supreme Court, entered into an interrogation of Clarence Thomas about natural law. And he asked Judge Thomas, do you believe in natural law? And Judge Thomas's response was sort of this way, like, of course. It's built into the Declaration of Independence. It's built into the Constitution. How can I be a constitutional lawyer and reject natural law? And Senator Biden said, nobody believes in, in that anymore. There, there aren't any law schools that teach natural law. Do you have anything to understand any of the consequences of that? There's no such thing as objective truth. Ethics have now been reduced to a matter, a matter of preferences. And whatever the ruling class prefers, that becomes the law, the very thing, by the way, that Karl Marx predicted would take place in Western civilization. And the reason for this is that contemporary America and contemporary human beings in the West have been systematically and radically cut off from eternity. One brief observation about the philosophy of pragmatism that defines truth as that which works. Dr. Sproul the Younger earlier spoke about teleology, the principle of telos or purpose. And so when somebody says they want to be practical and pragmatic and say to me, I've heard professing Christians say that they're pragmatists. Away with them. Get them out of the church. They're poison. Pragmatism and Christianity are utterly, totally, and eternally incompatible. Pragmatist says truth is not ultimate, it's not objective, it's what works for me. And the basic critique of that philosophy is that it is one of the most impractical philosophies a person can ever embrace. Why? Because there is an eternity, and there is a God who dwells there, who is from everlasting to everlasting, and who holds every one of His creatures accountable to Himself, and will judge every one of us subspecies aeternitatis, meaning under the species or from the perspective of the eternal. Now, if you embrace pragmatism and define truth is that which works for you today, in the hic et nunc, in the here and the now, and consider not the question of eternity, at some point you're going to have to face a judgment from the perspective of eternity. Jesus warned the people of His own day who were unsuspecting pragmatists by asking them questions like this. What shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Jesus was being very practical. What is the good if it works only for now? What good is it if your goals and your plans and your ambitions are accomplished in this world 
and you lose your soul. Or what will a man give, Jesus asked, in exchange for his soul? When you lose eternity, when you lose the eternal perspective, you lose your soul. That's why the great book is so greatly important and why rooting and grounding our young people in the truth of God that does not pass away, that is not merely a preference, that will not change in the next election, is not achieved by referendum, but comes from the mouth of the eternal God who changes not is so critical. Now, when we consider the attribute of God's eternality, we are dealing with one of the most important aspects of God for the cause of apologetics, for the defense of the very existence of God Himself, which is so much under attack in any secular society, as we've been told already so brilliantly this day, that if you want to change the end of the story, you have to change the beginning of the story. And the beginning of the story that chokes every pragmatist and every secularist on the face of the earth is the statement, in the beginning, God. If you get rid of that, you have no threat from Christianity. You can let people enjoy Christian religion on the reservation like good little Indians, just don't give them any fire water, and let them say their prayers, sing their hymns, gather together. We don't have to burn them at the stake as long as we get rid of that first line in the beginning, God. And as long as we can convince everybody that there is no access to eternity. There is, of course, access to the past, and we see paradigms in the world of science change and sometimes change radically. If you don't like the contemporary dominating paradigm of the secular scientific world, wait 10 years. It'll change. Probably won't take that long. A few years ago, I saw a copy of my high school physics book. It was like reading Looney Tunes. <laughs> it was so antiquated and out of date, and people would laugh if you would articulate the laws that we were taught about physics. I grew up when we were taught that the universe was a closed mechanistic system. And anybody who talked about an expanding universe and a big bang was considered somewhat on the lunatic fringe. Now the big bang is the order of the day, and we can get back to within a quadrillionth of a nanosecond after creation. I had some correspondence with Carl Sagan years ago about the Big Bang, and I asked him the question that anybody would ask him. I said, well, if all of the matter and energy of the universe were condensed into a point of singularity, for all eternity, in a state of equilibrium, in a state of organization, and the law of inertia was in intact, that those bodies at rest remain at rest unless acted upon by an outside force, and those that are in motion remain in motion unless acted upon by an outside force. I'm very ambivalent about the law of inertia because I love to play golf. And the ball sits on the tee, and it's not going anywhere until I, as an outside force, 
exercise. And I hit the ball, and I wanted to just keep going as far and far and far as I go. But if it weren't for resistance and friction acting upon the flight of my ball, I'd hit one drive, and it'd still be going <laughs> forever. So far past the hole, I couldn't find my way back <laughs> to putt it. And so I have ambivalent feelings about the law of inertia, but I don't question that it's a law. And I asked Professor of, uh, what's his name I just mentioned? Saying and crossing. What was it that for all eternity this point of singularity was resting? For eternity! And then one Thursday afternoon at five o'clock it blew up. <laughs> with, 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 with the biggest explosion of all time, the explosion that created everything that is right now. And I said, what was the outside force, Carl? You know what he said? I don't want to go there. <laughs> I said, that's a problem. You don't want to go there. But if you're a scientist, you have to go there. If you're a truth seeker, you have to go there. You can't stop when it suits you to stop. And that's why I say eternity is one of the most powerful, persuasive arguments for the existence of God that there can be. Now, I'm going to take a few moments to recapitulate that. Many of you have heard me do this before, but you learn by repetition. We heard today what is God. We learned today who is God. And I have another question I want to ask you. And the question is, why is God? I mean, why is there a God? Now, I can give two different answers to that question. One of them is so simple, it's not just simple, it's simplistic. And I wouldn't be offended if you laughed me to scorn when I give you the simple answer to the question, why is there a God? But the second answer to the question, why is there a God, is heavy, deep, complex, requires all of the cerebral power that your Creator has given you to experience the depth of it. Would you like to hear the two answers? How many would like to hear the two is? All right, here's you want a simple one. For those of you that like the KISS principle, keep it simple, stupid, you know? Like my friend from Staten Island, I mean, this, this, was, this was made for you. <laughs> ah, go on, get out of here. <laughs> uh, why is God? Here's the simple answer. You ready? Why not? <laughs> Why not? I mean, it doesn't get any easier than that, does it? Now, how about the hard answer, the heavy one? You want that? Who lives, who's from Long Island? <laughs> Here's the heavy one. Why is there a God? Why not? <laughs> the answer, why is there a God, is why not, is because the reason there is a God is because there cannot not be a God. The reason why we say why not is that because God cannot not be God. Right. Say it again. That's right. That's right. You bet. Preach it. Don't go back. <laughs> Stick with it, right? All right. Thank you. 
Now, what I'd like to do to show you the truth of what I just said, that God, there cannot not be a God, and prove that to you, is that I have actually brought, not evidence, but scientific, empirical, and formal, compelling proof of that assertion today. And if you can just wait for three seconds, I'll go and get my proof that I can present it to you. I'm going to go over here. Pick this book up. It says Trinity Hymnal. Do you see this? Do you think it's an optical illusion? (laughs) You know, when I show it to you, you will notice that my hands never leave my wrists. (laughs) You tracking with me? I mean, you believe what you're seeing. This is not. You're not hallucinating. You think there's really a book in my hand? Huh? Promise. Okay. How many of you agree there is a book here? Thank you. No, I'm not going to use that book. That's a cheap way to prove that God cannot not be God. Let me use something else, something more convincing. Here. Here it is. Once and for all, settles the issue. Huh? Mr. Peepers. Huh? Some of you remember. Jeepers, creepers, where'd you get those peepers? Huh? Gosh, oh, gee, oh, where'd you get those eyes? Okay. Now, here it is. Compelling, absolute, not relative, proof of the eternal existence of Almighty God. Now, why is that? Very simple. If these glasses exist, if anything exists, the book, the chair, my shoe, these glasses, then something, somewhere, somehow exists necessarily. Now, on St. Thomas Aquinas' five proofs for the existence of God, I think the one most compelling is the one most people overlook. Most people jump at the cosmological argument immediately. They say, everything in this universe must have uh, a cause. Well, they get in trouble right away. If I say everything has to have a cause, I run into the problem that uh, Bertrand Russell ran into when he read from uh, John Stuart Mill, where John Stuart Mill said, if it's true that everything has to have a cause, then God has to have a cause, and we can't use the argument from causality to get back to God. Because it would just go beyond him and say, who made God? I tell the the story about the two little boys that were arguing the point. And the one little boy said to the other one, who made the grass? And that boy said, God made the grass. Who made the trees? God made the trees. Who made you? God made me. Thank you. (laughs) All right, now comes the brilliant question. Who made God? And the little boy said, God made Himself. And we say, ooh, (laughs) what a brilliant little boy this is. No, it's foolishness. You know, God didn't make Himself, and you know why He didn't make Himself? Because He can't make Himself. Nothing can make itself. For something to make itself it have to be before it was. What could be more clear than that? 
To say that something existed before it existed is to say that it was and was not at the same time and in the same relationship, which violates the most fundamental principle of science, the law of non-contradiction. You say, well, God can do anything. No. He can't lie. He can't die. He can't make Himself. He can't be God and not be God at the same time and in the same relationship. Nothing can make itself except according to the most brilliant minds of our day, the whole universe. <laughs> when the Hubble telegraph telescope went up, listening to the radio, they get a quote from one of the most prominent physicists in the world, and he's quoted on the radio as I'm driving down the road. 15 to 18 billion years ago, the universe exploded into being. I almost exploded into non-being <laughs> when I heard that. Exploded into being, what did it explode from? You see, you scratch these guys and sooner or later all of them come up with some doctrine of self-creation. They won't call it that, they'll call it spontaneous generation like they did in the 18th century Enlightenment with the French encyclopedias. I've told at the National Conference a story of a Stanford Nobel Prize winning physicist who said, wrote an essay, I read it, I'll never forget it, he said, the day has come when we can no longer speak about spontaneous generation. It's an untenable concept. It's something out of nothing. Now we have to be more judicious, more scientific, and speak in terms of gradual, spontaneous <laughs> Stop me if I'm lying. I mean, you talk about mythology. You, you talk about superstitious. What gradual, spontaneous gen generation? That means you can't get something out of nothing quickly. You really got to be patient, you know, <laughs> for that to happen. Now, you're laughing, and you should be laughing, because I'm poking fun at some of the most brilliant people in this world who become klutzes when it comes to questions like this. Ladies and gentlemen, if there ever was a time when there was nothing, no glasses, no hymnals, no shoes, no people, no mountains, no oceans, nothing, absolutely nothing. What could there possibly be now? Nothing. But only the craziest people are saying that there's nothing out there. It's all an illusion, and even those who are having the illusion are an illusion. <laughs> That's why Descartes went to such great pains to prove his own existence, because he understood if he could prove that anything exists, glasses, people, shoes, or books, then you must have something that has always existed. Because if ever there was a time when nothing existed, nothing could possibly exist now. You have to have something that is self-existent, something that is, that has the power of being within himself. Again, where Bertrand Russell fell down and John Stuart Mill was they lost the game in terms of definition. They said, if everything has to have a cause, then God has a cause, and so we don't settle anything. No, no, no. The law of causality does not say that everything has to have a cause. It says that every effect has to have a cause, and it's tautological. That is, that principle is true by definition. An effect by definition is something created by a cause, and a cause by definition is something that produces an effect. And so all you have to do cosmologically is to 
find something that's uncaused. And if you can't find something that's uncaused, you can't find the scientific explanation for anything. The only alternative, well, there are two alternatives. One are that the glasses are eternal. Hmm? Or they're self-created, which I've already shown how that's impossible. Or ultimately, they're created by something that is uncaused. Those are the only options. You can look at all the different sophisticated arguments. You can boil them all down to those three. And if anything exists now, what Aquinas was getting at is something exists necessarily. And what we mean by necessary existence, and I'm going to try to wrap this up quickly, is that that existence is necessary in two ways, both ontologically and logically. Ontological necessary existence means ontology is the study of being. And for an ontological necessary being to be, it is a being who has the power of being within himself that depends on nothing outside of himself or itself, if you will, at this point, nothing prior to it, nothing coming from it, it, upon which it depends. But it is altogether self-existent. The power of its being is within itself. That's a necessary being who is ontologically be, who ontologically is, and that being cannot not be. Its being is eternal and necessary. It doesn't derive from anything else. It suffers no contingency or mutation. It is what it is eternally and necessarily by virtue of its own being. That's why I said, why is God? Why not? Because the one who is the eternal self-existent being cannot not be. Don't you see that? That's the ontological necessity. The logic necessity is this, which I've been trying to show you in the last few minutes, that if anything exists now, then logic demands somewhere, somehow, there is a ontologically necessary being. Otherwise, nothing could be. Without a self-existent eternal being, all you would have is nothing, pure nothingness. And what is nothing? Nothing. I can't even say what nothing is, because nothing is not. Nothing is the absolute absence of being. But if there's anything, if there's something, there has to be a necessary being who is eternal. And really what that comes down to is this. If there is such a thing as a now, there must be eternity. Because without eternity, temporality is utterly impossible. But since there is a now, there is an eternity. You know, when we started Table Talk magazine 35 or so years ago, 
I was asked to write a byline in every issue. And I chose, consciously, a title for my article. I'm not going to test you to see if you know it, but some of you will. For 35 years, I've been writing an article under the title, Right Now Counts Forever. You see, the culture that Harvey Cox described can only say to you, right now counts for right now. And if all right now counts for is right now, then it doesn't count at all, because right now is already gone. It's gone. Right now counts forever, because there is a forever. And because there's a forever, everything that we do, everything that we experience, every pain that we endure, every tear that we shed is significant forever and ever and ever. Let's pray. We thank Thee, O God, that You have created us with eternity in our hearts, and there's no escaping it at all, because You live and inhabit eternity, and You inhabit all that exists. We thank Thee, O God, that You are and that you have given us the unspeakable privilege to read your autobiography, to study it, to understand it, so that we can know that our lives matter and count forever.